Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of World Panorama. Here we are getting you your weekly dose of major international news with a perspective. I'm Sana Khan. Before we get you detailed reports, here's a look at the top stories this week. India votes against Sri Lanka but skips amendments to US-backed resolution at UNHRC. Lanka slams war crimes resolution. Stunning statement by Chinese president says resolving the boundary dispute with India won't be easy. Pope Francis officially starts papacy in the Vatican that draws thousands, calls for defense of weakest in the inaugural mass. And in sports, Rafael Nadal wins Indian Wells BNP Paribas Open 2013, defeats Argentine Juan Martin Del Potro 4-6-6-3-6-4. This week, the story in focus, the U.S. resolution against Sri Lanka over alleged human rights violations, which was passed at the United Nations Human, right, human Rights Council in Geneva. While 25 countries, including India, voted in favor of the resolution, 13 countries, including Pakistan, voted against it, and eight countries abstained from voting. India, by taking the stand that it did, again broke away from neighborhood solidarity to vote for a United States-sponsored resolution condemning Sri Lanka for its human rights violation against its Tamil minority, putting New Delhi's regional ties and the federal government at risk. And disturbed with India's lenient stance, if one was to go by the DMK, the Tamil Nadu-based political outfit, has pulled out of the government over India's stand just days before the vote in Geneva. The resolution, however, only passed the Sri Lankan government for a credible and independent probe into the killings and human rights violations, although such resolutions are not binding. The resolution and developments relating to Sri Lanka has roiled the government in India and is expected to have far-reaching consequences for both regional politics within India and diplomacy in the neighborhood. Let's also tell you that Pakistan is already gloating over New Delhi's discomfiture over voting against a neighbor with whom it has had strong historical ties. The resolution was tougher than the one last year, but was well short of text and tone that human rights groups and Tamil partisans demanded. So let's try and delve deeper into what such issues mean for a country's polity vis-a-vis -vis such international issues as we've seen in this case, particularly for India. Joining me on the show this week is former Ambassador Mr. Shiv Shankar Mukherjee, Welcome to the show, sir. I'll Thank be you. coming to you in just a bit. But before that, why don't we have a look at what happened in Geneva and thereafter. Tamil Nadu boiling and raging, anti-Sri Lanka protests intensified on Thursday. In Chennai, the situation got out of control in certain places, with the police arresting protesters. This after United Nations Human Rights Council urged Sri Lanka to carry out credible investigations into the killings and disappearances that took place during its nearly 30-year civil war that ended in 2009. We are not satisfied with the progress to date, which is, the, which is why we felt the need to go forward with this resolution. The 47-member Geneva Forum adopted the resolution with 25 countries in favour, including India, and 13 against, including Pakistan, who consider the resolution as an arbitrary and politicised intrusion. Eight abstained from voting and one delegation was absent. No determination has been made by the council members yet as to whether an international probe is required. What we're hoping for is a domestic, credible, independent investigation that satisfies the people of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, meanwhile, rejected the US-sponsored resolution, calling it counterproductive. We have made it very clear that we are committed to uh, moving further forward. Uh, we will, of course, continue to update our friends in the international community of the progress that is made, being made. India, which voted for the resolution the last time around, was not only slammed by regional parties back home, but also drew ire from its island neighbour. We are thoroughly ashamed of India. Our neighbour, big brother, who should have acted differently? He has become like the lap dog of Obama. The United Nations voiced concern at reports of continuing violations including killing, torture, curbs on the right to freedom of expression and reprisals against activists and journalists. 
Resolutions such as that brought by the United States are not binding, but the scrutiny by the UNHRC maintains pressure on the government to pursue perpetrators of crimes committed in the conflict against Tamil Tiger rebels. All right, let's take this issue forward, sir. What do you feel? Did India play its role in the perfect possible manner? Could it have done anything more or less as far as uh, voting against Sri Lanka and voting for the resolution was concerned? How do you uh, see this? Well, you know, there's no perfection in diplomacy. Um, uh, so, so I think, uh, although it's very fashionable to criticize the government, I think we successfully managed the situation. It, it was a question of management. It was mm. a question of tightrope walking. Uh, certain facts are very clear. One is Sri Lanka is a very close strategic neighbor. Right. Uh, there's been a history of uh, uh, an insurgency there starting from 1978. Mm. If you remember, even with the LTTE insurgency, uh, we had to uh, actually change policies more than once. Uh, here you have a situation where there are, there, there's a very large state which is a supporter of the central government, which has emotional bonds with the Tamils in Sri Lanka. Right. You have a situation where the Tamils in Sri Lanka are actually citizens of Sri Lanka. Hmm. And uh, you have then this vote in, uh, in uh, Geneva, Geneva. Right. Which, uh, which, which accuses uh, the, cent the government in Sri Lanka of war crimes and uh, human rights abuses. Hmm. Uh, the Sri Lankan government's position is that they were fighting an insurgency, they were fighting a body that wanted to secede from the state. Right. And it's nobody's case, uh, leave alone India's, hmm. that uh, that should be allowed. Right. So we saw a multi-layered diplomacy there working yes. in, some, uh, in yes. some cases, even contradicting India, its own stand, because it had to take care of... Uh, the ethnicity of the Tamils as well, Absolutely. also international uh, pressure. Yes, it's not a zero-sum game. <laughs> uh, right. So, talking about the regional politics, uh, do you think, uh, how should India balance, you know, the regional politics, keeping that in mind, and we are talking about the international obligations, pressures as well. Do you think... Uh, this was what India had to do in this particular case because now the DMK has already pulled out of the government and there the government will definitely fall short of numbers. Well, uh, that is uh, going to be a purely domestic issue, hmm. what happens uh, in the lead up to the elections in 2014. Right. But in terms of foreign policy, hmm. uh, I think we successfully managed a situation which was very, very... Uh, you know, in, ter in terms of the domestic fallout within India, uh, in terms of a coalition government which depends on support from different parties. Right. I think it was well managed. I think uh, uh, in, you talked about the regional balances. We have a situation in India where we are the largest South Asian country. Uh, we have borders with every single country in SARC hmm. and the others don't. Right. Uh, we have, I think managed to, uh, 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 maybe not perfectly to use mm. that word again, but we have managed to sustain a credibility mm. of a democratic country with, 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 a, certain, uh, with a certain ethics uh, in terms of our diplomatic efforts. Let me just uh, pose another question to you, which might seem a little, uh, you know, me digressing from the main point over here, but uh, looking at this particular issue in Sri Lanka and not just this, uh, Bangladesh, other neighboring nations, and China's expanding role in this particular region. Do you think the way India is moving forward, you're talking about the way India is handling its foreign policy at this point in time, vis-a-vis -vis this particular issue, it's doing well enough to keep uh, the increasing Chinese influence in check as well? Well, you know, this is, this is a, a difficult question with a difficult answer. There are two streams of thought, I think, in those who... Um, those who are uh, involved in, in, in diplomacy in mm. India, in government and outside, including the media. One is that we must be very, very careful about the string of pearls policy that, uh, that China is supposed to have, mm. encircling India, uh, making sure that India uh, remains weak and bottled in. Mm. The other uh, stream of thought 
is that the world is big enough for both China and India. Hmm. We must maintain our uh, strength militarily and economically right. without getting uh, paranoid about Chinese expansion in our neighboring countries. Hmm. China is the largest country in the world, is the second biggest economy in the world today right. in purchasing power terms. It, it, it is a given hmm. that the Chinese economic influence particularly will uh, will show itself in in right. um, you know in our neighborhood because hmm. china is a neighbor too uh, there are elements in our look east policy which give gives us i think if i can speak frankly which gives us the opportunity of uh, if if you take the asean nations the the southeast uh, and the, the the far east hmm. and japan it gives us the opportunity to find partners to maintain our uh, our uh, position right. as uh, a country uh, without without really getting uh, too worried about uh, what china is doing in the neighborhood all right my last question to you and uh, let's come back to the resolution again uh, this particular resolution is different in one respect very clearly from the one that was uh, introduced last year at the UNHRC and that is calling for an international, credible international investigation which is what even India has been saying this time around. But looking at the fact that these resolutions are non-binding on Sri Lanka and we already know that Sri Lanka has strongly rejected this resolution even before the voting took place, uh, what then is the larger, you know, what, what's the bigger picture when it comes to these resolutions put forward by the UNHRC? Well, um, as you quite rightly said, these are non-binding resolutions. Hmm. They are not binding on the uh, nation of Sri Lanka. Right. And I think we made our point, and hmm. I think we should leave it at that. Okay. We made our point in terms of supporting uh, a resolution that, that uh, makes certain accusations about hmm. human rights abuses and, and so on. And uh, for the rest of it, it is for the Sri Lankan government, I think, to respond to the international community. Many, many questions remain as far as human rights violations are concerned. What could Sri Lanka have done? What is it doing? And was it, if it was uh, India in its place and the resolution was for India, what would India have done? But thank you so much for uh, throwing some light on some key issues that we were trying to discuss over here, Mr. Mukherjee. Thank you so much. Once thank again. you. We are taking a very short break. After that, a report uh, on the Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi's India visit. Stay tuned for that and more. Thanks for staying with us. China's new leader, Xi Jinping, has indicated that he will look to follow his predecessor's policies in engaging with India and seek continuity in bilateral ties as the new leadership in Beijing takes control following a once-in-a-ten-year change. More importantly, the Chinese president made it clear that India should not expect China to resolve the border dispute. That, it said, was a complex task. For the first time, a Chinese president has said resolving the boundary dispute with India won't be easy. China and India need to concentrate on boosting relationship without being held back by differences in the border region, the new president Xi Jinping said on Tuesday. The statement comes days before Xi's meeting with Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, perhaps for the first time in years, during the BRICS summit in Durban. According to a transcript released after Chinese President's meeting with editors from BRICS countries, Xi said, the boundary question is a complex issue left over from history and solving it won't be easy. No Chinese leader is known to have made such candid observations on the border issue in recent years. Chinese leaders and the foreign ministry usually describe the border dispute as a problem left over from the history and seek peace and tranquility on the border. The first leader born after China's independence in 1949 also unveiled his five proposals which said China and India should maintain strategic communication and keep the bilateral relations on the right track. Xi's comments suggest the new Chinese leadership will largely continue with the previous administration's approach to India which emphasized boosting economic ties and cooperation on multilateral issues while at the same time appearing less willing to engage on more difficult issues such as the border dispute, transboundary rivers and China's ongoing projects in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi's three-day state visit to India, which ended on 21st of March, marks a sense of renewed engagement between New Delhi and Cairo in the post-Arab Spring era. On his part, Morsi underlined a strong desire for a strategic partnership with India.
The visit of Egypt's first freely elected President Mohamed Morsi to India this week has set the stage for a long overdue transformation of bilateral relations. We discussed the huge investment opportunities that are made available by the major project of developing access to Suez Canal and the importance of India's contribution to this project. It's a strategic project that aims at developing the national economy of Egypt and increase revenues that are expected to reach more than $200 billion. Morsi held extensive bilateral talks with Prime Minister Manmohan Singh during his visit that came in the same week when Egyptians celebrated the second anniversary of the 2011 referendum in Egypt which paved the way for parliamentary elections and a new constitution. The Prime Minister offered all support in the democratic transition process in Egypt and expressed satisfaction with regard to the growing interaction between the Election Commission of India and its counterpart in Egypt. Economic partnership has rich possibilities. We have agreed that information technology, services, electronics, small and medium enterprises, manufacturing, fertilizers and renewable energy constitute important areas of cooperation. Egypt's location as a bridge between Asia and Africa has tried a major global trade route together with its skilled human resources makes it an attractive business destination for India. The two leaders discussed bilateral defence ties and measures to enhance cooperation, including through the forthcoming Joint Defence Committee meeting scheduled to take place in Delhi in April. Back home, Morsi faces a plethora of challenges where sectarian violence and street protests have become the norm. The economy has tanked and employment and poverty are rapidly spiralling out of control. All of this has led to increasing popular disenchantment with his government. Taking this into account, reviving bilateral, especially economic ties between India and Egypt might just be the new beginning both nations have been looking for. Pope Francis celebrated his inauguration mass on Tuesday before an estimated crowd of 2 lakh people as well as the president of his home country of Argentina and other world leaders. The 76-year-old was elected the 266th pontiff of the Catholic Church, the first from the Americas on Wednesday following the surprise resignation last month of Pope Benedict the 16th. The inaugural Mass for Pope Francis on Tuesday marked the official start of his papacy, drawing thousands to St. Peter's Square to witness it. After a ride through the square for the first time in an open-top Pope mobile, Pope Francis prayed at the tomb of St. Peter's in Basilica for a few quiet moments before entering St. Peter's Square to address the crowd. It means respecting each of God's creatures and respecting the environment in which we live. It means protecting people, showing loving concern for each and every person, especially children, the elderly, those in need, who are often the last we think. In another sign of the informality that is already a mark of his papacy, Francis abandoned the bulletproof Pope mobile, frequently used by his more formal predecessor Benedict, to tour the sprawling square in bright sunshine. Pope Francis is going to be a great thing for the church. You know, every pope has their own personality. John Paul II led the church with his rock star personality, Benedict with his incredible intellect. And I think Pope Francis is going to lead the church with his pastor's heart. Today he receives the pallium, the wool, symbolizing that he is a shepherd, a shepherd of the people. So I think he's going to lead with his beautiful pastor's heart. Dignitaries from around the world joined a huge crowd in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican to attend the inaugural Mass of Pope Francis. The Mass formally installed Francis as the new leader of the world's 1.2 billion Roman Catholics.
Time now to take a look at some of the other big international news in a quick wrap. Here's Globe Watch. U.S. President Barack Obama insisted that now is the time for Iran to take meaningful steps to resolve its nuclear standoff with the West. Obama, during his visit to Iran, used the occasion of Iran's New Year celebration to try to ratchet up pressure on Tehran. But this time, he focused squarely on its disputed nuclear program, which is expected to be high on the agenda when he visits Israel, Iran's arch-rival. The United Nations Security Council unanimously passed a resolution on 19th of March extending the UN's mission in Afghanistan for another year. With a vote of 15 in favour and none opposed, the Council approved the extension of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan until 19th March 2014. Syrian rebels opposed to President Bashar al-Assad accused his government of carrying out a deadly chemical attack near Aleppo city. The Syrian government and rebels have accused each other of launching the attack in the town of Khan al-Assad in what would, if confirmed, be the first use of such weapons in the conflict. Syria's state television channel said rebels fired a rocket carrying chemical agents that killed 25 people and wounded dozens. But rebels of the Free Syrian Army denied the charge in a video statement posted on a social media website. A car bomb detonated near a popular restaurant on Tuesday in Iraq's capital city of Baghdad. The bombing took place near the entrance of the Green Zone, which houses key Iraqi government offices and some foreign embassies, including the US Embassy. Five people were killed and at least 15 others wounded. The blast occurred on the eve of the 10th anniversary of the US-led invasion that ousted the country's former leader, Saddam Hussein. Bangladesh's figurehead President Zillur Rahman died on Wednesday at a hospital in Singapore at the age of 84. On Thursday, Bangladesh declared a three-day period of national mourning and a public holiday. Rahman was a senior leader of the ruling Awami League Party before Parliament elected him president in 2009. He was flown to Singapore's Mount Elizabeth Hospital on 10th March for treatment of respiratory problems. The President's office said Parliamentary Speaker Abdul Hamid will be acting president until the legislature elects a new president. Shifting gears, let's now get you all the sports updates that you've missed from through the week. Have a look at sports action. Rafael Nadal added another triumph in Chapter 2, his remarkable comeback, when he came from a set in nil 2 down to beat John Martin Del Potro of Argentina 4-6, 6-3, 6-4 in the BNP Paribas Open final. The Spanish left-hander, who was sidelined for seven months last year with a left knee injury, overcame a gritty challenge from the hard-hitting Argentine to win a record 22nd ATP Masters title and a third at Indian Wells. It was Nadal's 53rd ATP singles title his third of the year after appearing in four successive finals and his first on hardcourt surface since Tokyo in 2010. Kevin Streelman, Justin Leonard and George Kotze were tied for the lead after the third round of the Tampa Bay Championship. The trio charged to the top of the congested leaderboard to finish the day level at six under par at the tricky Copperhead layout at Innsbruck Resort. But the tournament remains wide open with another 13 players, including defending champion Luke Donald, lurking within three shots of the leaders. Lane Nugent quit as head coach of Australia's scandal hit swimming team after enduring months of pressure in the wake of damning report into the behaviour of his swimmers at the London Olympics. Nugent, who oversaw Australia's worst performance in the Olympic pool in 20 years at London, had volunteered his resignation but hoped to return in a different role after taking a break. Nugent, who helped Australia swimmers bring home their second best Olympic medals haul at the 2004 Athens Games, initially tried to play down the controversy but later admitted he had made an error of judgment in failing to act. Time now for all the very latest news from the world of movies and lifestyle. Here's our entertainment wrap. Mainland Chinese film Mystery emerged as the big winner at the 7th Asian Film Awards in Hong Kong, while Iranian and Turkish movie Rhino Season swept three technical prizes. Wearing a long chiffon dress sparkling with sequins, Chinese actress Michelle Yeoh, best known for starring in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and 007's Tomorrow Never Dies, lauded Asian cinema. Yeoh also received the Excellence in Asian Cinema Award. Brazil's top fashion trendsetters began showcasing their upcoming summer collections on Monday as Sao Paulo Fashion Week kicked off. The biannual week-long event will feature 25 labels and some of the world's most beautiful top models including Victoria's Secret's Carly Kloss. The 35th edition came greener than ever with an eco-friendly decoration by world-famous design duo Fernando and Humberto Campana, best known as the Campana Brothers. 
Lady Gaga is not letting her hip injury cramp her style. This week, a photo surfaced online of the pop star sitting in a custom-made 24-carat wheelchair with a canopy. Gaga is recovering after undergoing hip surgery last month to repair a labral tear of the right hip. Pop star Madonna presented CNN anchorman Anderson Cooper with a Gay Media Watchdog's top honor in recognition of this stature and accomplishment as an openly gay journalist. The singer wore the scout uniform as a way to call for the lifting of the rule that bans gays from joining the U.S. youth organization. The annual Vito Russo Award is named after the activist and film historian who was one of the founding members of media watchdog group GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And that's all we have for you in this edition of World Panorama. I'll be back next week, same time, with more world news. Till then, you can join us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. This week, we wrap up with some breathtaking visuals of some of the world's most well-known landmarks turned green in celebration of St. Patrick's Day, organized and coordinated by Island Tourism Board. This year saw the pyramids of Giza and the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro illuminated emerald green for the first time in the marketing campaign's fourth year. Goodbye and thanks for watching.